So anyway, it's been uh, two years since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, we've actually seen a huge impact on being able to see in healthcare settings, particularly in specialist care. And lots of you, I'm sure, have had appointments um, over either video, uh, telephone. Um, some of you may have had non-urgent procedures or operations uh, for conditions other than pH cancelled or postponed. Fortunately, we're now in, what, March 2022, two years down the line, and much is returning back to normal. Uh, this new normal, whatever it will be, sometimes will be appointments via telephone or video, and um, which might be more convenient for some people at the time, but please be reassured your care will not be affected. Our, our desire is to ensure that that's not happening. As PH professionals, we're really enjoying seeing people back in clinic, and we wanted to put together this short video, which I'm, I'm going to have a conversation with uh, Charlie, Charlie Elliott, one of the PH consultants in Sheffield, uh, to just explore how we can be certain that hospitals are safe places to come back to, because uh, many of you probably for the last two years have not actually stepped uh, into a hospital setting at all. Um, so, Charlie, just we, we're actually looking at as we're coming out of the pandemic, and mm -hmm. you know, at the end of March 2022, we know we've not not beat it yet, and we've still got things to do. But healthcare uh, has changed dramatically over the last two years, and it was changing before that. But one of the things we were keen at the PHA to do was to produce some resources, some materials in which we could explain what this new NHS looked like. You know, if you come into hospital now, what's the difference and things like that? And I, I, this is a really simple question, and forgive me for asking simple questions, but I've got a simple mind. Just, just sort of as best you can as a, a consultant, why is it important that we, we don't disengage with, with seeking medical help? And that could be something as simple as going to see the GP, those things that we might have seen the GP before. Just why is it important at the moment, do you think? Um. I think there are lots of points there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of engaging in person with healthcare, um, I think there are times that there is no alternative or no replacement for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's true, and you said before the pandemic, we were starting to adopt different ways of interacting and, and engaging with patients mm -hmm. with non face to face appointments, either telephone or video. Um, that was more when it, it, it obviously when it's appropriate mm -hmm. and for convenience saving time giving alternatives for patients but then obviously the last two years it's become dramatically different and was for a while an absolute necessity now i know i mean just so break that down then so i know from your perspective charlie you you went from seeing all patients face to face to to the majority would have been remote monitoring telephones and things like that from your perspective, what was the the good things about remote monitoring at that stage? But what do you think are the weaknesses? Because then that gives us some context to thinking how we might address the balance between the two. So, what was the what what do you think we've learnt about the good things of, of of doing more this thing called remote monitoring, whether it's telephones or videos or whatever? I think we've realised that we can do it, mm -hmm. and that there are lots of situations where it's entirely appropriate. Um, and and for that, I mean particularly in an area like ours with a service nationally, like for pulmonary hypertension, with several specialist centres around the country. Mm -hmm. Inherently, there's lots of travel done by patients. That travel is expensive in terms of time, money, um, it's inconvenient for lots of people. And we know that when there's a need to do that and there's a gain, people are very happy to do so. But likewise, if, if there are things that we can do safely and appropriately and and effectively mm. without people having to travel, I think that's a, a real bonus because we appreciate that there can be times when it's a whole day out mm. of a patient's life traveling to the hospital for what might be a half hour to an hour encounter with the medical team. And if you can do that for somebody at home, then that's gotta be a win for them. And what, what do you think now on reflection of you and your colleagues looking back, what are the potential weaknesses of just not, con why, why not just continue doing that then? What, what are the weaknesses? I think we've always realised that there are some things that you definitely can't do on telephone, you can't even do on video. I mean, with a video call you can see somebody, you can get a good idea how they are generally, um, but you can't examine somebody. Mm -hmm. You don't have such a rounded conversation, I think, sometimes, particularly on the telephone, it's more <coughs> business-like and it's shorter conversation often. Um, when you see a patient, even if you don't realise it, uh, when you examine a patient, you pick up a lot of other non-verbal cues from them, how they are, if there are any other things happening. 
Um, and there are other things that we need to do with patients that we can't do over the telephone. Mm. The regular assessments, um, things like walking tests, blood tests, mm. um, you, you just can't do that on the telephone. And you, there are potentially developments in the future where we'll be able to do more of these things at home, but they're still being researched, really. Yeah, and I suppose I suppose one of the things that you lose if you've not got somebody in front of you in a hospital setting is the is the, the ability to do something spontaneous, like oh, we'll do an yeah. extra blood test, or we will do a chest X-ray, or we will do a, a breathing test while you're here. Is th there could be quite a delay. You could say well, we can get the GP to do it. So I suppose face to face, there's that spontaneity that can sort of problem that very quickly. Absolutely, and you, you pick up things that you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. So if you, you see a patient, you examine them, and you say, well, how long has this been like this? Mm -hmm. And somebody might not even realize that some things yeah. are matter, and you, you, mm -hmm. you find something a lot quicker. Yeah. I think more often now that we're seeing patients coming back um, after maybe extended periods of follow-up, any niggles or problems that people might have had tend, have tended to go longer than they yeah. would have if we've been seeing people regularly face-to-face. Okay, so we, we, we've got some certainty of the value of, of a sort of blended approach to telephone and face-to-face. -to -face. Going back to the face-to-face, -face, which is the, the bit we want to really fa focus on, many people, all our patients, a bit were, were termed, it was what, nearly two years ago since Boris Johnson said stay at home because mm -hmm. of this virus and we didn't know what's going to happen. And a lot, we've, we've learned a lot through that, but we, we have to understand and realise that people are... At different levels, worried, fearful, concerned of, of coming into hospitals because they, they think it's, you know, hospitals are potentially a, a, a source of infection and that's where the COVID-19 virus is still existing and that. What reassurance, what, what are you doing differently in the hospital setting that would give real um, reassurance? I mean, the way that we're running at virtually every single appointment is dramatically different from, should we say, two and a half years ago. Uh, virtually every hospital encounter you have in, in your own experience is that it's a busy place, mm -hmm. there are people everywhere, there's lots of hanging around, waiting in crowded waiting rooms and things like that. And, and I think pH centres are no different. Um, certainly in our clinic it, it used to get very busy at times and I can imagine that if you've been shielding at home and avoiding crowded places, if that's your last memory of going to hospital, it's not going to be something you, you, you wish to get back to. But I think we can, as much as we can, we can reassure patients that although um, social distancing and other measures have been dropped in lots of environments, we've had them in the hospital since the very start, and they're, they're the same pretty much as they have been all the way along. We've dramatically reduced the occupancy of clinical areas <coughs> so that where previously there may have been 20 people sitting in a large room, now there's about five mm -hmm. maximum, and a member of staff looking after all of those patients. Um, we have PPE is still mandatory on all the wards in the entire hospital, and in in well, even, what's PPE? Just, just sorry, your protective equipment like masks. Mm -hmm. um, so face coverings are still mandatory in the hospital, and when we're doing clinical <coughs> uh, assessments, so when we see a patient, we're still wearing our gloves, aprons and things and changing those, washing hands between every single patient. Mm -hmm. um, and we're using different rooms as well. We're using the, the dedicated clinical rooms and we have them cleaning, you know, is still to a very high level, mm -hmm. more so than it was before, even though we've always had good standards for cleanliness in the hospitals. It, it's still at that higher level though. Mm -hmm. So it, actually, it sounds though like hospitals are probably a very different environment than they were two and a half years ago, and, and it's not a bad thing either. That possibly what we're seeing in a, the clinic settings is what it should have been like before, but the busyness of everything never allowed us to stop. So we've stopped and, and I suppose reinvented the, the clinic environment. Do you I think? think in some ways it has both the nature of the encounters, as you said about. <clears throat> face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face. -face. Those were changes that were happening already and it's just been rapidly accelerated. The, the cleanliness, social distancing, infection control, I think has gone off the chart, yeah. obviously with us being in a pandemic. And it's a case, it, it's maybe not what was necessary before, um, but I think the difficulty for us and what's gonna be interesting going forward is where everything then settles Settle down up. in the future. I, I don't imagine that, in the future, we'll have such strict rules. We'll not be wearing masks all the time. 
um, not when the prevalence of the condition drops to a certain level, yeah. um, but but for the foreseeable future, unfortunately, that's where we are. What well, one of the, the sort of frustrating things that I know patients report and, and family members is, in the past, pre-pandemic, it was usually quite common to see patient and mum, dad, wife come to clinic with them. Is that still the case? Is it different? How, how is that done? You know, because you were talking about one of the reasons clinic areas were very busy with people is that you usually had, you know, uh, Gladys who would come because she was due in clinic, but her husband would come as well. So has that changed? It has changed. Um, as we said, the, the numbers of patients coming into the waiting areas or the number of people in waiting areas has been reduced dramatically. So that now really is patients and family, friends, relatives who are accompanying a patient will have to wait outside um, for the majority of the time. So that works both ways, I think. Um, I think in the past, like you said, it was comforting for individuals involved, um, but sometimes it, it was a downside and that it made everything very busy. Um, at the moment, it means that a given individual might not have a dependent person with them, but the reassurance then is that there's less, it's less busy and there's mm. less infection risk. And when it comes to the actual clinical consultation, we are still able to have some relatives in. Um, so for the actual consultation part of the day, rather than the waiting around part of the day. And there's always the opportunity with um, the technology these days, when people have mobile phones, mm -hmm. is that even if they've got a relative who's not there, or even if somebody's come by hospital transport where they would normally have brought a family member with them when they can't, we, I think we're much better now at, at offering or, or being open to the suggestion that we can have the family member on the phone. On the phone, yeah. Uh, last week we had, I had um, a patient with the son in the clinic and he was anxious that his sister would find out what happened, so she was on FaceTime as well. It was, yeah. And it again, I suppose, well. I mean, in a way, it's, 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 it's not funny, but it, it, we should have been doing this before, shouldn't we? And yeah. what, the, what the pandemic has done is, is said you can do it, and actually mm -hmm. we like doing it. It's not for everybody, is it? I mean, technology, yeah. and, and I, I mean, I'm, I hate sort of FaceTiming and stuff like that, but for some people, it works really well. And as you say, the diversity in pulmonary hypertension, because of it's a specialist service, people do have to travel further. So including the, the rest of the family in that way has been really good. Just to sort of tie this up then, Charlie, because regardless of what you've just said, some people, and not an insignificant number of people, and this is not just people with pulmonary hypertension, what the pandemic has done is highlighted huge anxieties, health anxieties. And no matter, you know, we were telling people two, two and a half years ago, don't come out of the house, mm -hmm. etc. And And this sort of getting to that point of getting out of the house and going to see either the GP or, or yourself in clinic. People that are really struggling with that, how do you think they should, what, what, what would be a good way of, of trying to work through that? Because it clearly is important for us to, to, to give the best care possible. We do need to see people at certain points. For that to happen, when this anxiety and worry, and somebody can't do it, what would you be saying to them? I think the first thing is to, to recognise what's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and that it's that, that you might be anxious about going to the hospital or even going out of the house because for a lot of people, as you say, it's not necessarily anxiety about the hospital, it's more of a generalised anxiety yeah. about going yes. out. Yeah. Um, but I think that's being, sometimes people are just saying, I can't come and I don't want to come. So I think recognising if it's that they can't come, that's fine, but if it's an anxiety related thing, recognising that and um, try to think about what's making you anxious about coming. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular thing that's troubling you? And then talking about it. So letting us know what the problem mm -hmm. is. And even if it just starts a dialogue to say, why do we want to see you yeah. in person and what it is that we can't do over mm -hmm. the phone or video clinic. And that just gives it more context. And then people realize that it's, it, it's not the same talking on the phone as it is mm -hmm. face to face. And lots of people feel the other way. They'd rather come in person than do things on the phone. So it, it works both ways. But I think discussing the pros, the cons, the, the things you can and can't do, just so that each 
person can then weigh that up mm -hmm. and make their decision. Because we can't force people to come if they don't want to. We can just <coughs> advise uh, the best that we mm -hmm. possibly can. And I think it's, it's really important for us to be honest and say what people's anxiety, lots of people are experiencing that. And, and because mm -hmm. we've, we've socially isolated that, we feel even more isolated because of it. And one of the purposes of doing this, this sort of thing is that it's normal, it's common. You don't have to have pulmonary attention to have health anxieties, as you say. I no. mean, I've got friends and family who are still really anxious about doing things that we're doing pandemic, going to the mm -hmm. cinema and things like that. And it's learning to that it's, it is okay. Um, and, you know, things are, particularly when we, we, we've got a constant 24 hour news that keeps going mm -hmm. on and on and on. And um, so, just to sum up then, um, going forward, particularly in pulmonary attention, probably this blended approach, telephone, mm -hmm. something. Like, People have got anxieties to make them known. So maybe if it's really problematic to ring the nurse specialist team up as a, as a starting point, or um, maybe it's, it's becoming a bit easier to speak to GPs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the, the final thing is that the hospital environment is a safe environment, isn't it? Um, uh, well, yes, like you say, it's still one of the most protected environments mm -hmm. you're gonna see out there. And I think it's reassuring as well, Charlie, to hear you sort of just remind people that you know, from your perspective, your job is to protect people. Is, 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 and yeah. that's, you, so you're going to ensure that people are protected and it's a, a safe environment, you and your colleagues. Uh, from, from yourself to, I think one of the biggest, just a shout out for, you know, the cleanliness of hospitals is really high. One of the biggest shout outs in infection control is domestic staff in, in clinical areas mm -hmm. as well. But, you know, the biggest co infection control people around and mm -hmm. um, it, is, it is really po a, a positive sort of message. So, one, thank you for, for your time. Um, I didn't realise you've been here for 20 years and in pulmonary hypertension for 20 years, gosh. I remember when you used to nip her and yeah. stuff like that, yeah. I've taught you everything you know. I remember when you still had hair. I know, that was, that was a, a, a true as well. Anyway, thank you very much.